much. <clears throat> Afternoon all. Afternoon. I hope you've been enjoying today. Thank you for that introduction. It's always interesting to hear what other people say about yourself. Um, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Rupert Merson, as has already been observed. Um, my uh, first degree was in English literature, which is, I suppose, not your orthodox um, beginning for this sort of thing. After English literature, I did chartered accountancy. Why did I do chartered accountancy? Well, what else can you do with a degree in English literature except chartered accountancy? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> no doubt I have some fellow travellers in the room, chartered accountants. Yes, the elite, that's right. Okay. After qualifying as a chartered accountant, I went on one of those careers fairs, you know, recruiting students for your firm. Um, I uh, was uh, sent back to my university to recruit. At the dinner afterwards, allegedly, I drank a little too much and uh, allegedly told the head of human resources that the reason why our firm recruited idiots was because we had idiots doing the recruiting. <coughs> 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 he took this personally <coughs> and rang me up the following morning and asked if I remembered the points I'd made the previous evening. I had to say I was a little vague on the details. <coughs> he said, never mind, you made some good points under influence. So good that you've now got the job of heading up graduate recruitment for nine months, <laughs> <coughs> covering a recruitment season and somebody else's maternity leave. Um, so that's how I got into human resources. So much for long-term career planning, incidentally. Some years later, I had his job. I was head of human resources, junior partner in the firm. It was then I had my business school experience. I was sent to... Harvard as a sponsored student, I was supposed to come back with wonderful ideas about human resources, but I only had one idea about human resources. What was that? Get, job. No, get out of it as soon as possible. <laughs> <That's right. clears throat> now, for most people, their business school experience is a career-changing one, I'm afraid, which might come as a, an alarmist notion to some of you who are interested in buying our services or not, but it was for me. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> I got out of human resources and went back client side, necessarily exploring the gap between accountancy and HR, which is where all the uh, most interesting business challenges and solutions lie, of course, not on the disciplines, but in between them. As generalists, we need to address general business problems, not the specific ones that a business school likes to think you can compartmentalize them into. In a real world, of course, business problems are multi multidisciplinary. Um, I left that firm some years ago, I now run my own firm of uh, advisors. I'm adjunct faculty here, which means I spend some of my time here, I do a lot of teaching here, teach uh, uh, stuff uh, in and around strategy and uh, uh, the uh, owner-managed business is my particular forte, the management of growth. Um, uh, what else do I do? I spend a third of my time with my clients around the world. My clients turn into case studies. My uh, case studies turn into students. My students turn into teaching material. It's, um, it's a nice mutually reinforcing circle. Why do I tell you all about that? Because my background reinforces my prejudices. My prejudices uh, inform my teaching and I, I, I will inform the content of the next 40 minutes or so. What prejudices do I have? Well, one thing is the title of my session says it all. I believe that business is an art, not a science and we can explore the implications of that. I get that from my literature background, which I still hang on to. I also get it from uh, another job I have on the side as um, a church organist. That's what the school I went to, incidentally. Uh, and anybody know who else went there? Shakespeare, Shakespeare that's right. Uh, Shakespeare, our second most famous old boy, after <laughs> me, of course. <laughs> 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 obviously, that you are the most famous. Absolutely, <laughs> you've spotted it well. <laughs> you may be wrong. Yeah, I might be wrong on that there. So. This is my, me and my brother just before a uh, uh, performance of uh, Handel's Messiah. He was uh, playing the organ and harpsichord for me and I was um, doing the conducting. That's something else I do on the side. So business is an art, not a uh, science. I get from my uh, prejudicial background uh, as, as an artist rather than a scientist. Um, as an HR person, I believe uh, and one know from experience that human beings are irrational, unpredictable, unscientific things which comes as a 
a trouble to those of us who work in management and business schools, attempting to persuade people to do what we want them to do rather than what they think they should be doing. Uh, not necessarily what they want to do, they will do things anyway. And th th that's the reality of the real world, of course. Um, as an accountant and an HR person, as I've already noted, I believe that business problems are multi-generational and too much of our thinking is inclined and encouraged to reduce problems to the overly simplistic. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised when the answers we get to our initiatives are unpredicted and people do not behave as they're supposed to and what we're hoping for in terms of a solution doesn't actually happen. I get that from my background as well. Management, above all, is a practice where art, science and craft meet. I suggest to you that too often in our discourse, in an institution like this and in our management practice, we give too much attention to the science, too little attention to the art, and sometimes not attention at all to the craft of management. And if we want to be realistic about it, not only should we merge the art and the science, uh, the HR and the accounting, but to, there's a far more complicated reality that we need to capture. For example, as an accountant, I like the language of numbers. I am used to, as an ex-head of an HR department, working with accountants who boasted about the fact that they didn't understand people. <laughs> I'm used to, uh, uh, as an accountant, working with um, HR people who boasted about the fact that they couldn't tell the difference between a two and a five. And well, of course we need both of those things to be able to take the real decisions in business. And when we're looking at financial statements, the numbers are meaningless unless we can convert them into a story or a set of stories. The story that the management are trying to tell us, the story that they're boasting about, the story that they're trying to hide, that they hope that you're not going to be able to find out. And then, of course, the story that's yet to be written about the future, driven by the decisions that you're just about to take. Now, as an accountant, as the other accountants in the room will confirm, I spent three years of my life being trained to take decisions using out-of-date information based on information that's already irrelevant when it's published. It's called walking backwards into the future. So we, again, are surprised that we don't get things right. To get the story out of the numbers, we have to be able to deploy the subjective as well as the objective. We need to be able to imagine as well as rationalise. We need to be able to understand the stuff that really matters. We need, for example, to understand that accounting convention takes us to this artificial construct called profit, whereas what matters is cash, and that can be a long way from what profit is, of course. We also need to believe the story that the numbers are telling us. And in my experience, humankind is going to be overly optimistic when looking at numbers. And our ability to be prejudiced by our own optimism when looking at a schedule is amazing. The numbers say we're just about to go bust. Nah, no we're not. No we're not. We're going to be okay. I created the business. I have faith in it, of course. An entrepreneur's ability to be prejudiced in this way is quite extraordinary. Capacity for irrational optimism in the face of ir ir inevitable bankruptcy, absolutely extraordinary. In an institution like this, we use case studies. I don't know whether you've used case studies today at all, probably not. No, and well, certainly the MBAs, we use case studies. In my executive programs, I use case studies. Case studies I love, they're literary constructs. They're slices of reality that we bring into a classroom <coughs> and we test our models and frameworks against them. And if the models and frameworks don't quite fit with the case study, I suggest to you it's the model or framework that is wrong, not the case study, because the case study is reality. Yeah? Problem with case studies, of course, is that they're too short. They're only you know, 15, 20 pages long, but can you capture the whole of reality in 15 or 20 pages? No, you can't. But to capture the whole of reality, you'd need the Encyclopedia Britannica, and that's not practical, of course. 
So we can forgive our scientists, we can give our, forgive our management thinkers for attempting to simplify. But as they do simplify and shorten, we need to fill in the gaps. Again, how? With imagination, by putting flesh on the bones of the protagonists that we're finding out about, by putting ourselves in their seats and working out how we would behave if we were them. This is what we do with case studies. It's what we do as part of business education as well. Unfortunately, of course, business and the arts have a pretty dim view of each other. Here's a great business text. Shakespeare in Love, seen the film? Wonderful film. There's a little clip for you, for you here. I can't show you the film itself, but we have Ned Allain, um, uh, founder of Dulwich College, if you're interested. Um, uh, a big, big actor of the day, somewhat disappointed in the film that um, his character gets killed off halfway through Romeo and Juliet, which doesn't fit with his perception of his own ego and importance, of course. He looks dismissively at Fenniman, who fancies a bit part in Romeo and Juliet. Why? Because he's providing the money. And rather than just provide the money, he fancies himself as an actor as well. We have Ned Allen. Who are you? Who are you? Can you put that contempt in there? Who are you? What does Fenneman say? He says, I'm, oh, oh, I'm the money. To which our actor friend can only say, then you may remain, so long as you remain silent. That's how us artists think of you business people. Full of withering contempt. Do you know your place in the world? Yeah. This is the problem with art and business and the relationship between the two, of course. Anybody know who this is? Who's this? No, not me, no. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah. Scott Fitzgerald, Scott Fitzgerald. Who was Scott Fitzgerald? Great Gatsby, that's right. He's a US novelist, great uh, Gatsby author. Also an uh, advertising executive in his younger days. Advertising is a racket, like the movies and the brokerage business. You cannot be honest without admitting that its constructive contribution to humanity is exactly minus zero. Now, mathematicians in the room are already bristling <laughs> about the notion of minus zero. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, as an artist, I'm comfortable with this concept, of course. Having once found the intensity of art, nothing else can happen in life that can ever again seem as important as the creative process. Whereas you as business people, me as an erstwhile business person, he says, I have now discovered the reality of the world, which is writing novels rather than taking business decisions. That sort of pompous, condescending attitude to commerce colours the artistic community. I suggest it colours a lot more as well. Emma. Anybody heard of Emma? Who wrote Emma? Jane Austen. Wonderful book. Wonderful book. 200th anniversary a short while ago. December 1815 it was written. Oh, it says 2015 there. It's published in 1815. <laughs> 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 Wishful thinking. 1815 it was published. 200 years ago. Um, um, uh, and here we go, a little quotation here. I'd like somebody to act this out if we have. Um, uh, this is uh, Mrs. Elton. I've given you the script on the board. Mrs. Elton here is describing the neighbours of her friends in Bristol. For those of you who don't know Mrs. Elton, Mrs. Elton is a very pompous individual. So I'd like somebody with a f good, fruity English accent, please, to read this out to us. Any volunteers? Come on, guys. Come on, girls. A volunteer to read this out. This is your chance for acting glory. <laughs> nice fruity English accent, please. Please, go on then, off you go. I have, a horror, I have a horror of upstarts. Maple Grove has given me a thorough disgust of people that sort. A thorough disgust of people of that sort? Yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a family in that neighbourhood who are such an annoyance to my brother and sister from the airs they give them. Yes, they give themselves. Can you imagine? <laughs> People of the name of Tupman. There's not enough contempt in your voice. People, <laughs> of <the name> of <laughs> People of the name of what? Tup Tupman. Tupman. <laughs> very lately settled there and encumbered with many low connections, but given them, giving themselves immense airs and expecting to be on a footing with the old established family. Such as ours. <laughs> How they got their fortune, nobody knows. They came from 
from Birmingham. Where do they come from? <laughs> Where do they come from? They came from Birmingham. Birmingham. Can you imagine? Birmingham. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> What's the problem with Birmingham? I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. What's Jane Austen's problem with Birmingham? Or rather, what's Mrs. Elton's problem with Birmingham? New money. Yeah, new money, yes, of course. Mrs. Elton, where does Mrs. Elton come from? She comes from Bristol, which of course is a very wealthy community, certainly in a, uh, late 18th century, early 19th century um, England. Uh, but of course, we only have to scrape away the surface a little bit to realise how Bristol made its money. The slave trade. Yeah, we can push that under the carpet. The slave trade apparently is respectable, whereas what goes on in Birmingham <laughs> is almost beneath contempt, this attitude to commerce. Emma Woodhouse herself uh, has got an attitude to Mrs. Elton. She's the daughter of a Bristol merchant. You know, those of you who think uh, uh, punctuation is not important, look at the power of that dash. The daughter of a Bristol merchant. You can always see her reaching for the bucket as she says it. <coughs> of course, he, he must be called, you know, merchant, I suppose. Merchant is a good thing, of course. Merchant is better than being a tradesperson or somebody who's involved in commerce. I remember my grandmother saying to me when I qualified as an accountant, Rupert, are you going to remain in the profession or are you going into commerce? <laughs> I know which she would rather, of course, in the hierarchy of things. Jane Austen herself considered herself to be gentry, county, and above the need to necessarily work at all. Uh, it's a relationship between uh, commerce, work, business, and all sorts of other things that go on in the community. Um, uh, it's a troubled one. It's not just a trouble between art and business. This is a very different piece of writing. This is, this is T.S. Eliot, The Wasteland. Who wants to give us a, a rendition of this one? Nothing funny about this, I'm afraid. We need a city gent, please. Anybody here from a city institution? A bank, perhaps? Any volunteers? Maybe someone with one of those sort of faint uh, New England accents. That would be good. <coughs> sort of half English, but definitely American. Anybody <laughs> pleased to own up to this in the room? <coughs> no? Come on, guys. <coughs> There's a T. T for Thomas. Yeah? <coughs> Do you have any volunteers? I'm going to have to pick on you in a minute. <coughs> Go on. Okay. Can try. Go on, try. <laughs> Under the brown frock. Brown fog of a window. You missed door. the first two words. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good start. <laughs> the two words are important. Unreal city. Unreal city. Yeah. Under the brown fog of a winter door, a crowd smote over London Bridge. So many I had not thought that had undone so many. Sigh, short and infrequent, were exhausted, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet flowed up the hill and down King William Street. To where St. Mary Woolnock kept the hours with the dead sound on the final stroke of night. This will test you. <laughs> <laughs> this is French, yeah? Really? Okay. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> no such thing as a free event at London Business School, I can tell you. Come on. Hippocrate Lecture? Mont Symbolic. Yeah, would you have anybody who's French in the room? Please, please. Hypocrite lecteur, vous semblable, mon frère. Get the point? Okay, and the, the impression that's being given of these chaps wandering up and down King William Street in the morning, are they enjoying themselves? What's T.S. Eliot saying about... Of these bankers flowing over London Bridge. It's a depressing existence, of course. And, until we read these last, uh, this fr uh, these, these phrases in French, which are from Baudelaire, uh, what, what, what do they mean? Uh, well, hypocrite um, reader. You hypocrite. Yeah. And uh, you're like me. Yeah, you're the same as me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my brother. 
my brother, yeah? And of course, T.S. Eliot can say that because he was also a banker. Yeah, he worked for Lloyd's Foreign Exchange Department, from which his friends were desperate to rescue him so that he could be a full-time poet. But T.S. Eliot had a secret. And what was his secret? He liked working as a banker. <laughs> he enjoyed it. You know? It was intellectually challenging. It was demanding. Yeah? His friends in the artistic community find this difficult to reconcile themselves with, but we can see the hypocr hypocrisy um, um, uh, overtly in the last line there. You know, you, okay, you can nod at this and pretend that you enjoy art, uh, and, re and, and in reality, we all know that's a far superior existence. But now come on, guys. Business is good. Business is fun. This is where important stuff happens. Now, we've got a similar double play happening in a business school as well. This is how... Uh, many of my friends and colleagues in the business school will start a sentence in an internal meeting. As social scientists, we know at the business school that dot, 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 dot. And I think social scientists, what's a social scientist? Social scientist in the liter literary world is uh, what we know as an oxymoron. <laughs> what's an oxymoron? Yeah, two opposite words together. Yeah? Social and science. <laughs> two words don't fit together. Social and art, maybe, but social and science, oh, yeah. got to be careful here. Perhaps not yet. Hmm? Perhaps not yet. Perhaps not yet. Because the sciences, in the physical ones, also took a lot of time to get to the stage where you can control them. And Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I mean, and maybe in an ideal or a state in the future, we can imagine uh, where we have a reconciliation here that's going to make a difference. Wow. You have three master's degrees and a PhD. It's all very impressive, but interestingly, I have no common sense whatsoever. <laughs> That's not the sort of thing you should say during a job interview. Well, I don't see why not. Come <laughs> <laughs> right? across that notion. Because the science of management, I get this from that well-known academic text called Wikipedia, but it um, captures it quite nicely. The fundam management science can be done on three levels, or research at least. The fundamental level lies in mathematical discipline, probability, optimization, dynamic systems, etc. The modeling level is about building models, analyzing them mathematically, gathering and analyzing data, uh, driven by statistics and economics. The... Uh, Application level, trying to make a difference in the world, of course. The management scientist's mandate is to use the rational and the systematic base techniques to attempt to inform and improve uh, real decision-taking in the real world. That's what, what we're trying to do here. That's what we, you try to do, we try to do in the real world with our decision-taking as we attempt to rationalise, systemize, simplify, generalise and then build decision-taking off the back of that intellectual framework. We have to make assumptions. Assumptions uh, which, in some ways, are at the heart of our problem. Perfect or near-perfect rationality. What's the problem with perfect or near-perfect rationality? Humans are not rational. Profit maximization, what's the pro problem with that one? Define profit, that's an accounting uh, uh, question. Any other problems with profit maximization? Hmm? Where it ends. Where it ends, yeah. Where it starts, I would suggest. You know, many of us, many, I, I, I've worked with people, you've worked with people who will do what they do in spite of profit maximization, <laughs> sometimes deliberately to move in the opposite direction. It's back to the irrationality of human beings, of course. What about statistical reliability? <laughs> <laughs> They're not reliable. That's a pretty good start, isn't it? And then before we get too far, you know, the new tyrant, big data. I don't know how fed up you are, as I am, at being categorized by some system. It's because I am blonde, five foot seven, 53 years old, like golf. Um, um, uh, so therefore, I must be able to be interested in purchasing this, that, and the other. And I, you, you say, come on, I don't, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not like that. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a human being. Don't, don't reduce me to something I am not. What's this? Porters, porters, how many are them? Five, what are they? Forces, yes, yeah? it's Porters Five Forces, a, a very famous way, a uh, well-known way of attempting to categorise and systemise um, analysis of um, industries and markets. Many of us, I am sure, have built this sort of analysis into our business um, plans uh, and uh, forecasts 
uh, and, uh, and, and, and initiatives. And as you do, sometimes you come across, or often you come across, some interesting challenges. Okay, so we pick our industry, and then we uh, apply the analysis to it. But there's a question you've got to ask first. Which industry are you in? How, how, for how many of us, is that a difficult question to ask to start off with? How many of us have got customers who are also suppliers? Yeah. How many of us have got suppliers who are also competitors? Yeah. How many of us have got uh, stakeholders that fit into all of these boxes simultaneously? Because that, that's the reality of what happens in the world out there, of course. Now, we can't knock Porter for attempting to simplify because we can derive something off the back of it. But how much do we miss? Maybe we need to modify our thinking. Here's a less well-known piece uh, work, uh, two Americans, Brandenburg, Renel Buff, attempting to apply game theory uh, to uh, strategic analysis. Unsurprisingly, and no doubt deliberately, this little schema looks a little bit like four, five forces. It's a challenge to it. Yeah, we have the company in the middle, but are attempting to say, in addition to competitors, customers and suppliers, we have complementers, people that were operating parallel to us. Uh, neither one thing nor the other, who we could have a relationship with. Um, it's, it's tr try and give a complexity uh, to the five forces thinking that perhaps better captures what reality is about. Let's move in an entirely different direction and show another attempt to simplify reality. <coughs> this is uh, the score of Speminalium. Anybody heard Speminalium? Anybody sung Speminalium? I know you've all heard it. Let's have another question. How many of you have seen Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> you prepared to admit it in this room? <laughs> oh, it's, it's my friend again. Okay. <laughs> you remember the music in Fifty Shades of Grey? Speminalium. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we've all heard Speminalium. Let me see if I can get a little bit of, of it, of it um, sounding in the background here. Um. <laughs> Remember it? She's getting undressed. <laughs> Uh, glorious noise, this. Glorious noise. We haven't got time for it, I'm afraid. Um, takes about 16 minutes, the whole thing. Um, um, written by Thomas Tallis, a uh, composer who lived a long, long time ago and lived for a long, long time. Um, uh, uh, nobody knows quite when he wrote this. Uh, piece in 40 parts. That's a 40-part mass. One theory, uh, not particularly well regarded, is that he wrote it for the 40th birthday of Queen Mary. Um, uh, Queen Mary um, in Tudor, England, um, and which is why it's got 40 parts. Now, if we look at the score, which, as you can see, I've got here, and to capture 40 parts, it's a bloody great big document, uh, we can see the parts as they come in. We can see that to simplify 40 parts, he's broken it into eight five-part choirs. We can see that we start with choir number one, as you heard, then choir number two joins, then choir number three. And as we pass over, we will see that uh, choir number four comes in. By the time choir number five comes in, choir number one has dropped out. So it's actually quite rare that we have all of the 40 parts coming in at once. I'll hand it around. Some of you can take a look at it. If you can't read music, it doesn't matter. You'll get the feel for it. Now, if we do this in the way perhaps it was meant to be done, we will have all of these 40 singers lined up in front of us, and we will hear the music go along the line. And when it gets to the end here, it's going to go back in the opposite direction. Then we will have briefly all of the 40 parts in for a few bars. Then we'll get the choirs over here being answered by the choirs over here. Then the choirs in the middle being answered by the choirs on the flanks. That's what the reality of the experience of listening to this thing uh, in a real room with real singers would be like. 
Can you get that from stereophonic music? In part, if you set up your speakers right, you can get the sound wandering back and forwards, but it's very difficult to, unless you're exercising a lot of imagination. Can you read that document that I've given out with any degree of comfort? No, you can't, which is why often we find ourselves as musicians reducing what is already a simplification to something that's even more simple. This is a piano reduction. Pretty well all the notes are there, but for one pair of hands to be able to play on two staves. But what do we miss? We miss the interplay of the choirs, you know, the echoing from one side to the other. Incidentally, those of us who are only too uh, keen to patronise and condescend to the intellectual capabilities of guys who lived four or five hundred years ago, just take a look at that. Amazing piece of thought concentrated into 16 minutes of document. An, an attempt to simplify one conception of reality into a document from which we can understand something. Let's take a, a simplification of the world using artistic constructs a little bit further. What's this? It's a lorry. <laughs> yeah, it's a lorry. And I'm interested in one <coughs> word in particular. That one there. What does that say? Metaphoric. Yes, which means what? Moving. Moving, so it's, it's transport. Transport is the literal Latin reconstruction of the Greek word, but metaphor is also a construct in literature, of course. It's a trope, metaphor, to describe something using a different frame of reference from somewhere else. Uh, there's an interesting quote here. It's been our custom in Germany to put engineers on boards, unlike the British, who favour accountants. That's worked well for us, but one consequence is that we have been inclined to think of our organisations as machines and to manage them as machines. Our minds tell us that the organisations we will need in the future will be more like villages or networks rather than machines. But we're stuck with machines because that's who we are. Yeah. I always remember the first time I taught in India. I pointed to the first student and said, I've got a degree in English literature. Anybody else got a degree in English literature here? Nobody put their hand up. I said, what's your degree? He said, engineering. Now, this is India. I said, how many other people have a degree in engineering in the room? How many hands went up? <laughs> everybody's. Everybody's hand went up. You know, it's, and you, you think, uh, to what extent do we have a, a room full of people whose intellectual thinking and personal prejudices are going to be conditioned by a way of thinking? And we're not going to be getting that variety that is necessary. Well, let's push this thinking. If we are engineers and we do think of ourselves and our organisations as machines, we can see lots of examples out there that reinforce our perception of reality. Indeed, some types of organisation that we would want to reinforce this particular metaphor. Yeah? We acknowledge, of course, that there are weaknesses to this thinking. It is overly bureaucratic. It presumes a degree of rationality and discipline. It presumes that the cogs, that's as we will call our human staff, are all identical. You just give them a bit of oil and they all behave in the right direction. But of course they don't. Machines also find it very difficult to change. Perhaps a different type of metaphor is one that's going to be more realistic. What about an organism, a living creature? has a degree of sensitivity to the outside world, degree of flexibility, makes room for alternatives. It evolves along with the outside world from one generation to another. It's necessarily very complicated, in some ways far too complicated for any manager to understand. Is that a superior way of thinking about our organisations? Well, in some ways it is, but it gives us some fundamental problems, does it not? An organism can look after itself. Maybe our staff should be able to look after themselves as well. Can you work well without supervision? Yes, I thrive on vague objectives and a complete lack of recognition for my contribution. Is this you? Yeah. Can you handle criticism? I'm not too proud to say it excites me. <laughs> It's an idealistic view as to what it is that an organisation looks like. Matrix organisations, no doubt many of us suffer from being at the point here. 
in the middle there with two bosses arguing with each other and conflicting in terms of, um, or giving conflicting instructions to us. Of course, you know, we can all identify the problems there, but we can also see the complexity that we're trying to capture. In some ways, this is an organic view of the world. Because whether we like it or not, at least this structure forces to the surface <coughs> the arguments that matter. Two bosses wanting to do two different things in the interest of the organization as a whole. You can act as a machine and pretend those problems don't exist. Do what you're told. Or you can bring those issues to the surface and say debate and argue about them. Are you finding that difficult? Well, we as an organization have difficult issues to face up to. An organic way of thinking about the uh, future. What about another metaphor? Organizations as brains. Institution like this, uh, uh, professional partnerships, or maybe networks of professional partnerships in a post-internet world where the boundaries between institutions are becoming more permeable, where the, uh, the, the law of diminishing firms has taken over from the, the law of diminishing returns, where you can bolt institutions together. You can network between them, between the people within a firm, between the firms themselves. Maybe this is a, a richer way of thinking about our organization. But it's another metaphor. Is it perfect? No, it's not. Maybe if we're being honest about ourselves, we need to capture all of these things in our thinking. Or we can acknowledge that each of these ways of reducing reality will help us improve our thinking about it, even though we acknowledge that none of them is overly rational. And then we can go back to our original challenge, and we can worry. We are in the UK. 75% of our directors are accountants. Are we open to what sort of prejudices that will take our thinking in the room. We're a, a, a German firm. We have lots of engineers on the board. Again, to what extent are we opening ourselves up to that sort of thing? Who's this? You. That's you. <laughs> okay. And there's the boss up there somewhere. And this is your organization chart. Got to look at it long and hard, of course until you realise there's something strange here. Here we've got the secretary who secretly runs the whole shooting match. Then you have the secretary, the assistant, assistant secretary, the typist and the bad speller and the bad typer. You got one of those? <laughs> those individuals who misses the word not out of important legal contracts. <laughs> have you had this person before working for you? Yeah. Then over here we've got a signer of parking spaces. Very important individual in this institution, I can tell you. <laughs> Top dog, underdog, yeah? Owner of negatives from last year's Christmas party. <laughs> yeah? So there's somebody here who's responsible for the chairman of the board's offspring. <laughs> yeah? This is not the organisational chart. This is an informal organisational chart. This is the one that doesn't exist, but it does exist. Do you know your informal organisational chart? Do you play it? Can you pull the levers that are there? There is research that would argue that if you compare the message that comes from a chief executive in an email or a document with the message that comes from Sheila next to the coffee machine as gossip, which one's going to be believed? <laughs> Sheila. She's, Sheila's going to be believed. Now you can try and shout louder in your official communications, your rational forms of discourse, or you can acknowledge gossip matters. We can use it. We can turn it to our advantage. One of my clients, some years ago, deploys what they call the Sheena mechanism. After each board meeting, they take Sheena aside and whisper to her something in absolute secrecy, knowing that within 40 minutes, it's going to get around the whole organization. <laughs> That's, it's, uh, you know, we might laugh at it, but it's what happens. Of course, you know, art can also be very, very rationalistic. Uh, unless you're really knowledgeable, you won't know what this is. This is Bach's Chacon in D minor for solo violin. Um, uh, a, a piece that, like Shakespeare's Hamlet, is far too long and far too big for the context within, it, it, within which it was created by a purely professional artist out to make money, in Shakespeare's case, good money from what he was doing. Bach's case, less so. You don't get a more rational mindset than Bach, finding himself 
bringing into his artistic constructs the irrational, almost by accident. This on the right-hand side, anybody know what this is? This is the art of fugue. Art of fugue, J.S. Bach. Last thing that he wrote, this is Contrapunctus 14. Uh, uh, unfinished here, what happens here? He dies. Yes, yeah, perhaps more interesting to see what happens just before he dies. He introduces a theme. There's the theme that crops up there. Ba, 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 ba. In German notation, this spells what? B A C H. Writing his own name as a theme. The fourth, uh, uh, the, uh, the third, third of four themes in the, of the, and, and the, what's going to be a, a quadruple fugue, the mastery, a masterpiece of his. Uh, of his entire career, and then he dies, dies at the act of finishing this thing off, bringing his own personal touch into the most mathematical and pure of forms. Talking about real human beings here, we need to have another recitation here, and because this is slightly longer, I've carved it up into little pieces, yeah, so we can take one piece each. I know you're good at this sort of thing, so give us the first few lines. This is a poem by Auden. A uh, uh, British poet turned American, died in 1973, I believe. The Unknown Citizen by W. H. Auden. And this unknown citizen doesn't have a name. It's called JS stroke 07M378, which might be how you refer to your employees in your official record. Go on, first few lines. He was found by the Bureau of Statistics to be one against whom there was no official complaint. And all the reports on his conduct agree that in the modern sense of an old-fashioned word, he was a saint. For in everything he did, he served the greater community. Please, next few lines. Blue. Yeah, blue. Except. Except for the war till the day he retired. He worked in the factory and never got fired, but satisfied his employers. Fired by Motors, Inc. Motors, Inc. Uh, yet he wasn't just gab or order his views uh, for his union reports uh, that he paid his dues. Our report on his union shows it was sound, and our social psychology workers found that he was popular with his mates and liked a drink. Mm, there you go. Well, <laughs> the press are convinced that he bought a paper every day, and his reactions to advertisements were normal in every way. Policies taken out in his name prove that he was fully insured, and his health card shows that he was once in hospital, but left it cured. Both producers' research and high-grade labor declare he was fully sensible to the advantages of the installment type and had everything necessary to the modern man, a phonograph, a radio, a car, and a frigidaire. Our researchers into public opinion are content that he held the proper opinions for the time of the year, when there was peace, he was for peace. When there was war, he went. And when there was Brexit, <laughs> he was married and added five children to the population, which our unionist says was the right number for a parent of this generation. And our teachers report that he never, never interfered with their education. Was he free? Was he happy? The question is absurd. Had anything been wrong, we should certainly have heard. It's interested in the data we have on our own employees whether it's bringing to our attention the stuff that really matters or the levers that we really need to be able to pull when we're trying to influence change and superior performance in our organisations or to the extent to which we treat our human beings like this and our HR department like a shed out of which we wield them. And then we're surprised when our cogs don't behave as cogs or as components in a machine, of course. Takes us to perhaps my last thing in the last couple of moments here, because we, of course, are also all cogs here, and as potential clients for this glorious organisation, we're also people who might be influenced one way or other by the things that we're looking at. For too many of us, this is our approach to our careers. I tried to dispel my negativity by drawing up a life plan. Work, 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 retire, die. Yeah, OK? <coughs> the ultimate rational... Uh, a linear progression, maybe we can punctuate this with a visit to a business school, of course. Or maybe we need to be more creative and flexible in our approach and our understanding to our own careers. Take your work seriously, but improvise your career. 
Those of us who set long-term goals for ourselves maybe are being far too rationalistic, far too objective about the reality of our own careers. Divergent Paths is a very good book recently published on the difference between the, uh, the academy, the, the law school, and the judiciary, what goes on in the real world of the law in the United States. Its title is taken from a poem, a well-known poem which some of you might have come across. And in the interest of time, let me give this one to you. This is The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller, Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by. And that has made all the difference. What's he saying? What's he saying? Don't follow the herd. Mm -hmm. Get out of the box. Get out of the box. Are we sure that's what he's saying? Because if you look carefully about it, these two roads mm -hmm. took the other as just as fair and perhaps having the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though, as for that passing there, had worn them really about the same. These roads, in some ways, look quite similar to each other looking back. And then, of course... Back here, I should be telling this with a sigh, but if we look back at the roads, in some ways they're the same as each other. Perhaps the problem is not the choice between the roads, perhaps the problem is our wish to look back and regret, rather than to look forward at the choices that we have. So perhaps that's a better way of thinking of the choices that we have as we take our careers as well. Here's another valuable business text. And a, <laughs> Superb literary construct as well, of course. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. It's our choices, Harry, that show us truly what we are far more than our abilities. Those choices that we can make need to be ones that capture the irrational and the subjective and the imaginative as well as the rational, uh, the productive, the remunerative. Looking forward, not back. We can't rewrite or reconstruct decisions that were taken a long time ago. Acknowledging the uniqueness in ourselves and our contributions to our organisations. That's the things that really matter, is it not? I've run out of time, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> So in conclusion, well, what are we doing? We're setting up contrasts and uh, plays here between the simple and the complex, between the model of reality and reality itself, between form and function, theory and practice, and of course between art and science. Please, I'm not saying that an artistic way of looking at reality is a way that uh, is superior to a scientific one, of course not. We've moved on a long way since there in the Middle Ages. But I am suggesting that there are alternative ways to what increasingly becomes a prejudicial way of looking at reality that can help us inform our decision-taking in institutions like this and, of course, in our workplace as well. Safety tip of the day. Always bend your knees when banging your head against the wall. Good advice. Yeah. I can't remember if managing as an art or a science. Well, neither can I, so maybe it's both. Can we leave it at that, please? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.